We're back from our break now, and we're going to start our second lecture for tonight, Lecture 14, Jesus and His Followers, the Son of the God Who Did Wrong. Okay. Uh, the environment of Christianity was the Pax Romana. It was the golden age of Rome and the age of Augustus. And the civilization that Augustus created was the environment in which Christianity grew. And so now I want to go back and I want to run through Rome really quickly and um, uh, look at Rome. On here, yeah. And, and I want to give you a visual impact of Rome. Augustus found Rome a city of brick, he bragged, and he left it a city of marble. And here's the city of Rome, which grew into a great metropolis under Augustus. And he bragged again that he had founded a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. Here is the forum under the early Roman uh, emperors. The artistic and ideals were balance and harmony, order and serenity. The Greek ideals, but with Roman innovations. For one thing, the Romans invented the arch, which allowed them to build much higher buildings than the Greeks could build. And here is the Roman forum restored as it would have been under Augustus. This is the Arab on which he recorded the rest gestae, the deeds I did, in which he bragged that he had saved Rome from civil war, he had brought peace back to the people of Rome, and had restored law and order. Okay. Um, Edward Gibbon in 1776 wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire and he said it started declining in the age of Augustus and then it declined for 1500 years, finally falling in 1453 A.D. What is wrong with that concept? Wouldn't we be quite happy and pleased if the United States lasted for 1500 years, even if it was declining, but to know it would last for 1500 years? Can you say that that's a decline if it lasts for 1500 years? So there's something wrong with that concept. But the age of Augustus marks an age of peace and prosperity. The second century was defined as the happiest time in human history, the Pax Romana, peace, prosperity, and a high standard of living. And the Roman Empire ringed the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean was the center of Roman culture. Um, I'm going to skip that, and uh, we have uh, a great age of writing plays. Plautus, Juvenal, Catullus, and Apuleius were writing the theater. The Romans liked comedies. They didn't like the serious Greek tragedies. They liked comedies. Have any of you seen A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum? That kind of slapstick comedy, that's what the Romans like. Kind of like American situation comedies that you see on TV, and that's what the Romans were involved in. Uh, this is the Roman Corinthian, uh, the Temple of the Sun at Rome, and it's, it's very like Greek uh, architecture, but it's a Greek facade to a solid Roman building, so it's different from Greek architecture. Um, Augustus built cities all over the Roman world and they were all alike. Everybody spoke Latin, everybody had a Roman or Greek education, all the buildings were alike. In there you can see the temp typical Roman buildings. You can see a theater, you can see a Colosseum, you can see a forum. All of those things were in every single Roman city so you could travel from one end of the empire to the other and you could find people who spoke your language, educated like you were, who lived in cities that looked just like yours. And so there's this uniformity of culture. Roman culture is spread in a veneer all over the Roman Empire. And, and we'll go back, well, we'll go back, well, we can't go back to that map. All right, yeah, Roman cities. Um, this, is, this is the kind of Roman work in building. Um, they built aqueducts. Their cities had running water. They had water piped into the city, and uh, the aqueducts were Roman. Roads. You can see that it's a road on one level and it's an aqueduct that brings water into the city from the mountains on the other level. These aqueducts were so well built that many of them still exist today and they're still in use. So the Romans were very great engineers. They were very practical and you can see the use of those arches in the building of the, um, 
uh, of the bridges and the aqueduct. This is in Nimes in France. There are some in Spain, uh, England. They're all over Europe. Roman roads link the whole empire together. And here you can see the Roman roads linking the whole empire together from one end of Europe to the other. And the sea lanes across the Mediterranean linked it across the sea. Um, here's a Roman road. This is one in England, uh, Salisbury Plain. And here is a Mediterranean empire linked together by the sea as well as by roads in Europe. And so it, it rings the Mediterranean. Here's an old Roman atrium house. Uh, people, uh, the standard of living was very, very high. And this is one reason that Gibbon said it was the happiest time in all human history because they were very prosperous. They're like the Americans. The Romans are very like the Americans. They had a high standard of living. Everybody was prosperous. There weren't very many poor people. Um, they lived in luxury. Here's the house of the tragic poet in Pompeii. Now you can see they really do live in luxury and, and they had a very high standard of living. Here's the form of the emperors as it was, as it was um, expanded in later times of the later emperors so that we have a collection of metropolises. This is an urban culture that spread all over the region that the Romans governed, the, the Roman Empire. The Pantheon is a great church. And here you can see this idea of a Greek facade with a Roman building behind it. You see that building behind it is round. It's made out of concrete and it has a great dome on it. And the dome is a Roman invention. You take an arch and you sort of expand it and that's what a dome is. And so this is a pantheon and the word pantheon means a church of all the gods, a temple of all the gods. And the Romans practiced complete religious toleration. Here is a cutaway view of the pantheon. You can see the elevation and the half section. Here is the interior. It's gigantic. And all those little niches in the walls are places where there are statues to all the different gods. The hole in the ceiling is the, is the sun god who shines over everything everyone equally and so this the Romans practice complete religious toleration except for the Christians and we'll see why that is in a moment uh, the, the amphitheaters all over Rome a round theater now uh, the Colosseum every city had its had its its temples its Colosseum its theaters here's the interior of the Colosseum at Rome uh, the gladiators fought the lions. They fought other people. Here's a, here's a, a coliseum or amphitheater at Pompeii. Uh, they, fought, they fought beasts. They had horse races. They would flood it and have naval battles in it. Uh, bread and circuses. The people were all entertained. And this happened in every city you know, throughout the Roman Empire. Here are the ruins of the Roman baths. As the government came more into the hands of the emperor, uh, even though it was a sort of myth that Rome was still a republic, the emperor really ruled. But as the emperor took, took the government more and more into his own hands, the people didn't go to the forum anymore to conduct the business as they had in the republic. Now they go to the baths, and here are the ruins of the Roman baths. In England, every city had its baths. They were huge, gigantic enterprises. There were shops and restaurants and libraries and, and swimming pools and, and uh, places where people could get together in theaters, and they were kind of like the Galleria, uh, a place where you could go and you could have a good time and everybody could gather. And this, instead of the forum now, the baths become the center of social activity. Okay, here is the great hall in the baths of Caracalla, and you can see how gigantic and grand they are, and I think the gallery is a good comparison with, with our culture. Uh, every city had its Roman arch, triumphal arches, that when the generals would go to war, they would come back and a triumphal arch would be built. Um, here are Roman villas in the countryside where people would go to the country. They would have their country homes, and they're kind of like the mini mansions in West University Place or Bel Air uh, that become very popular places for these aristocratic families to live. So here's a Roman villa. Uh, here are some Roman ladies of leisure. The, the, the women were very free and easy. The poetry of Juvenal criticizes these women for being so uppity, for, for acting like equals to all the men, having a good education and showing up the men. And so women were, were, were relatively free and, and had a lot of freedom of movement. And along with this, you had a lot of um, 
you had a moral decay and a moral breakdown going on in the Roman Empire. The family fell apart. There were lots of divorces. There was lots of adultery. Uh, there were children who were abandoned. Uh, a lot of birth control was was um, uh, practiced so that people stopped having children and there was a population decline and there was overall a breakdown of the family that happened during the, the Roman Empire and the Pax Romana. Hellenistic realism in, in art, it's a Hellenistic culture. It's, it's, a, it's a, almost a Greek culture that takes over the empire where you have photographic realism, not the idealism of the Greeks, but very realistic art that's almost like a photograph. And here's another example of that in Trajan's column. And, and so this, this was the environment in which Christianity appeared and grew and prospered. Okay, now let's move to Christianity and uh, Jesus and his followers, the son of the God who did wrong. Okay. Uh, the Rome was the environment in which Christianity grew, and I've just kind of outlined for you what that environment was. Okay, Augustus was the emperor. This is a propaganda statue. Augustus set the pattern for all the other emperors, and they did what Augustus did. Um, and we're going to see other emperors in the same pose as we look at the Roman emperors. Uh, this is Hadrian's tomb in the city of Rome. Hadrian was one of the emperors during the um, five good emperors in the second century. And um, when we have the Pax Romana, the great peace, here are the cities that are all over the empire, the forum. The cities were built on a grid plan, very much like American cities are built, with the streets in straight parallel rows, and so you see that grid plan. The environment of Christianity, um, as we see the prosperous second century. During the second century, a book called Apuleius, by Apuleius, called The Golden Ass, was written. And this is a very good book. You don't have any readings on The Golden Ass, unfortunately, but it's a, it's a really important book for the age of Christianity because it's written at the time when Christianity was becoming widespread throughout the empire and it's a, it's a it's a story about Lucius who's the main character he sees the second century through an ass's eyes and it takes place in the eastern part of the empire it's a novel of episodes and Lucius starts out a carefree young man adventuring having a good time his girlfriend works for a witch she's a servant girl for a witch he sees the witch put, witch put a magic potion on herself and turn into an owl and fly all over the city and Lucius says oh I want to do that and so the, the witch comes back, she turns back into a woman, and the girl steals a potion and gives it to Lucius, and he rubs it on himself, but she got the wrong potion. So instead of turning into an owl to fly over the city, he turns into an ass, and he can't talk anymore, and he gets kidnapped, and all his adventures, you see the whole empire through the eyes of an, an ass, and what you see is widespread robbery and murder and cheating and lying and adultery, hedonism and corrupt priests and, and, and religion that, that's absolutely meaningless because the priests steal all the money and, and, and go spend it on themselves. Homosexuality. Um, it's a complete breakdown of morality that you see in The Golden Ass. But it ends, it's the ending that makes the book so important because what it's asking is the question, isn't there more to life than just having a high standard of living, having lots of money and lots of luxury and lots of free time? Isn't there more to life than that? It's a search for a higher meaning in life. There's an antidote, and he knows, to the, he knows the antidote. The antidote to his spell of being an ass is to eat some roses. And every time he finds roses, they get snatched away from him under his nose, and he just can't eat the roses. He nearly gets killed a dozen times. Finally, he is saved, and he's only saved through the goddess Isis, who then gives him the roses on his promise to follow her. Isis is a goddess who, uh, who represents a, a religion of salvation and resurrection and life after death. Remember the legend of Osiris, 
where Osiris dies and he comes back to life and so this is a religion Isis, uh, belief in Isis promises life after death and salvation if you live a good life if, uh, so he learns Lucius learns the secret of the priests of Isis and, and they don't tell you in the book what those secrets are because they're secret of course and then he joins the priests of Isis and he worships, the, he worships her and this is how he finds his meaning in life that is through a higher religion that promises life after death through the living of a good life and this is the environment that Christianity grew up in there were other and then Isis is not the only religion that promises life after death okay here's a Roman a Roman banquet again the hedonism of life and the, a supper I'm sorry these pictures aren't too clear but but you know feasting and having fun and adultery and the baths and and um, seduction and and um, here is a priest of um, the religion of um, uh, I'm sorry forgetting this this religion um, it's one of the Eastern religions but but it, it's also uh, um, a religion of uh, life after death and here is the temple of Isis at Pompeii remember there's complete religious toleration in the Roman Empire and so you have temples to Isis all over the Roman Empire and you have temples to Mithra who is a, a sun god of the Persians that comes into the Roman Empire that's similar to Zoroaster here is Isis and uh, Horus her son and uh, at the same time the Roman Empire stops expanding at this time the expansion stops and the Romans build walls around the empire and this is the famous Hadrian's Wall in England but, but expansion stops and this means it's going to have economic consequences for the Romans here is uh, the fortified wall on the German frontier and here are Roman fortresses that you have the wall and then there are fortresses every few miles about a day's journey apart that ring the entire Roman Empire and these are built around it in the Pax Romana starting in the in the reign of Hadrian and so you see the closing off of the frontier okay and this happens again in the time of Christianity okay um, let's get that one here's the Emperor Trajan sacrificing at his new bridge across the Danube at the same time the walls are built around the empire uh, the Romans stop expanding and the peoples outside the walls are pressing on the empire the Germans on, on the borders of, of um, France and Germany uh, the Celts on the borders of Britain uh, the various African tribes uh, on the uh, in North Africa and the Persians on the frontiers in the east. Okay, here is a pyramid tomb of a Roman noble. Again, this this jumble of religions. Okay, and a Colosseum in Africa. And again, this is the uh, this is the lover of Hadrian. Homosexuality extended to the emperor. This is his lover. Um, and here is the Roman Empire connected by land and sea all right this is the environment that Christianity arose in okay this is the city of Nazareth uh, which is uh, the the in Palestine where Jesus was born okay Jesus was born in Palestine now where was Palestine okay let's go back to our map Palestine is in the east in the Holy Land the area you can see where Palestine is on the on the coast of the Mediterranean the far extreme eastern coast this was a backwater of the Roman Empire it's the middle of nowhere uh, it is it, it, it's happening on the fringes it's not happening in the mainstream in Rome and the Romans were unaware of the birth of Jesus or any part of his life during his lifetime they, they really had very little knowledge of where Jesus was okay and who he was um, he was he was born to Joseph a carpenter and to marry a young peasant girl and he preached for one year and uh, he preached to the urban working class craftsmen and fishermen and tent makers and prostitutes and tax collectors he preached to the common people and tradespeople and he was crucified at the age of 33 
for, uh, uh, for inciting the people. The sources for Jesus' life are largely the New Testament and the earliest sources are the letters that are written between the Apostles and the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, the Gospels are much later. There is one or two mentions of, of Jesus in Suetonius and in Tacitus, but they don't know who he is. They talk about some Jew, you know, preaching, or, or, or they talk about the followers of, of this Jewish preacher, and they don't even know his name. So the Roman sources are utterly unaware, the contemporary Roman sources are utterly unaware, not only of Jesus in his own lifetime, but of the Christians in the next hundred years after he preaches. There are two aspects of Jesus as we look at the preaching that he does. And we don't know what he looks like. There are no pictures. There are no paintings. I mean, there are lots of paintings, but, but, but we don't know what he really looked like because all of them are too late to, to be actual portraits of what he looked like. So there, 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 this picture and other pictures are as people imagine him later. We have no idea what he looked like, none whatsoever. All right, there are two aspects of Jesus. First, uh, he's portrayed as the Son of God and as the Savior, and the second aspect is as a social reformer and a revolutionary. Okay, here is the place of the appearance to the shepherds at Jesus' birth. He was born in, in um, he was born in Palestine. He preached for a year and was crucified. Uh, at the age of 33, here is the place of the appearance of the angels to the shepherds, and here is the city of Jerusalem, where he spent his last days and where he was crucified. Okay. Now, let's look at the religious beliefs. These are the, the beliefs, of the, the one aspect, the religious aspect. He was crucified and declared the Son of God, and he was deified. On the third day, he arose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And he will return one day, and he, he ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of God, and he will return one day to judge the quick and the dead at the last judgment, where everybody, where, where all of the faithful will rise up from the grave and, and, and live the life after death. Uh, the, the, the good who have followed Jesus will sit at his right hand and they will go to heaven. The bad who have sinned will sit at his left hand and will go to hell. Okay, on the right hand of God, the, the bad will descend to hell and have eternal punishment. Uh, the good will have eternal um, glory in heaven. Okay, so these are the religious beliefs of Christianity. And here is the crucifixion, uh, and we'll see this again, um, this scene again, but here is the crucifixion as he's crucified. Okay. Uh, here is Jesus teaching and preaching the social doctrines. And the second set of beliefs about Jesus are the social doctrine he, he taught, how to live and how to behave. Uh, you have two different versions of the Sermon of the Mount in your reading. Um, essentially, uh, and I'm summing it up here, and, and this won't be everything, the, the basic message he has is to love one another, love God and your neighbor as yourself, turn the other cheek if someone strikes you on one cheek turn the other cheek and let him strike you again blessed are the poor who will inherit the earth lay not up treasures on earth but in heaven if a man asks for your shirt give him your cloak also uh, the little children the little, he, he expresses love for the little children and asks them to come to him everybody is equal before God and he preaches to women as well as to men, and he treats women as equals. He has a number of women followers, and he often appears, when he appears after death, he appears to the women. Okay. He preached to the working poor. All his followers were working class, or they were, they were there were some tax collectors, there were some middle class merchants. His first converts uh, were, uh, were the poor, and Mary and Martha were two women who followed him, Mary Magdalene. The twelve apostles were his students who followed him, and among them was Judas the betrayer. Okay, what do you think the Romans, we've just gone over the Romans, we know what the Romans are like. What do you think the Romans thought about these teachings? 
How do these fit into what the Romans believed and thought? Yeah. They were quite hurt. <clears throat> I mean, they went against their ideas of polytheistic gods because he only believed in one god. Okay, there's only one god, so it went against the Roman ideas of polytheistic gods. What do you think the Romans would think about, for example, turn the other cheek? If your enemy strikes you, you should turn the other cheek. How do you think the Romans would react to that? What do you think they'd say? Everybody's smiling. What, what, <laughs> what do you think the Romans would say if you, they, if you, if Jesus told them to turn the other cheek if their enemies struck them? They would say, you've got to be kidding. You know, the Romans would never turn the other cheek. They would never turn the other cheek. What about blessed are the poor? What do the Romans think? The Romans think blessed are the rich, don't they? Okay. The Romans, the Romans don't care at all about the poor. The poor are to be exploited. The poor are not to be elevated to the best. Okay, yeah. The Romans expected their gods to do things for them. Yes. Uh, you explained about the god who did wrong and the Hebrew god didn't do things. I mean, it did sometimes, but it wasn't always what they wanted. So. Right. The Hebrew god was the god who did wrong because he did bad things to them, and, but he was teaching them by, by educating them, by punishing them when they did wrong. This is a god that the Romans would say, this is the god who did wrong. This is a god who preaches to the poor. Who, who says the poorest will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It says, it says a rich man, uh, it is as easy for a rich man to go to heaven as to go through the eye of a needle, or for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Okay, a rich man can't go to heaven. Now the Romans wouldn't say that. The, the Romans, so, so what he preaches is the opposite of everything the Romans believed and lived for. Okay, what did the Romans expect of a god? And you were, you were saying that the Romans expect a god to reward them. Remember that they had this ceremony that they went through, do u des, I give to you, so you give to me. I sacrifice to the gods, and the gods will give me victory in war, and the gods will give me riches and fame and all the things that the Romans want. Okay, this is not the same thing. This is something that is utterly alien to the Romans. If you were a Roman and told that, and you, and you were told that God had come to earth, what would you expect God to be like to come to earth? If you were a Roman and God was coming to earth, what would God be like? Yeah. He would kind of be like a conqueror, I would think, to come and, and show that he won't turn the other cheek and that he was of wealth. And, you know, he would be to, rich. He would be right. powerful. He might zap people with a bolt of lightning. Okay, where would he appear? If God appeared on earth, if you were Roman and you were told God appeared on earth, where would he appear? Yeah? Well, he wouldn't appear in a backwater of the Roman Empire as like a son right. from a carpenter and a peasant woman preaching to prostitutes and poor people and right. all that kind of stuff. He would be right in the middle of Rome in the richest part of the area and he would be probably of really good um, birth and all that kind of stuff. Yes, he would appear in downtown Rome. That's what he would be. And he probably wouldn't be a human. Uh, he probably would not take human form. A Roman god would not, would not take human form. Because um, think about human birth, how disgusting that is. No god would go through that. I mean, and, and so this is one thing. And it's humiliating to be a human. A god is so much more than a human. And, uh, yeah. I would say also, weren't the Romans kind of, they were, they were tolerant of their religion, but they were, they were still kind of antagonistic towards Jews because they felt themselves so exclusive. And this, the Jesus character kind of turned that upside down, making the Hebrew God just saying that it was for everybody. Yeah, exactly. This is, when, this is the way the Christians offended the Romans deeply, is saying our God is the only God. Because the Romans... Uh, the Jews... The Hebrews, the Hebrews were like, were like that, too. and the Christians inherited Jesus. that. Right. Yeah, and so the Christians said Jesus is the only God, and this offended the Romans. The reason the Romans tolerated the Jews was because the Jews, um, because it was their historic God that they had had for thousands of years. The Christians were new, and they were upstarts. 
Although at first the Romans thought they were Jews. Yeah. Comment. Also, the Jews were isolated. They weren't trying to go into other segments of society. Yes, yes. The Christians were militant um, proselytizers, missionaries. And the Christians were militantly out there trying to convert people. And this offended the Romans deeply. And we'll kind of get to that in a minute. So, so um, answering our questions here, what would he do? Well, he might zap people with lightning. He might reward the, the, the leaders of government and the best soldiers. Those are the people he would reward. Who would he hang out with? He'd hang out with the emperor and his court and the generals and the rich people. And Jesus did everything the opposite of what the Romans expected in a god. And so he was the god who did wrong. And here are some of the Roman gods who are powerful figures or beautiful. Uh, nobody ever said Jesus was beautiful, uh, at least when he was living. I mean, if you read the, the Bible, they don't, the, the Gospels, they don't, say, they don't remark on his, on his appearance, really. The Roman gods were beautiful. The forum is where the Roman uh, a god would appear on earth in the downtown forum, and he wouldn't undergo human birth. If you were a Greek philosopher, God would appear as a perfect shining sphere remote from human life. Like Platonism, Plato's forms of a perfect being uh, that, that would not have human shape. It would have the form of a perfect sphere, a shining sphere like the sun, maybe. Now, crucifixion was reserved for the vilest criminals. Only murderers and rapists and the worst criminals are crucified. And respectable people are allowed to commit suicide like Socrates. So Jesus had this terrible, terrible death that, that no respectable person would have. Um, the, uh, uh, a Roman god would favor the best people and turn the other cheek, give your cloak, give a poor man your cloak as well as your shirt. The Romans would laugh at you if you told them to do that. Okay. Uh, Peter and Paul uh, were uh, the, the ones who really spread the religion. We mentioned the sources on Jesus and, er, and the early Christians. The New Testament, Suetonius, Tacitus, the letters and documents. Okay. St. Peter was the rock on which the church was founded. Uh, Jesus said to Simon, you are Petrus, the rock, and on this rock I will build my kingdom. To you I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven to loose what I loose and bind what I bind. And so from the earliest uh, part of the church, Peter is revered as, uh, as the foundation of the church. And he is said to have gone to Rome, where he is said to have been crucified upside down. So he was crucified like Christ was, but not in exactly the same way. Uh, this text on, on Peter... As, as Petrus the Rock is the key text for the future papacy to rule the church. The other key figure in the early church is St. Paul the missionary. The Pax Romana gave him freedom to travel throughout the Roman world in peace and prosperity and unmolested on the roads by robbers or, or, or anyone. He could travel throughout the Roman world and he founded churches in the Holy Land in Asia Minor and Greece and all the way to Rome itself. In fact, there were Christians in Western Europe in the first century. So Paul is the missionary. Um, these activities are recorded in the Acts of the Apostles and the letters, uh, letters or epistles as primary sources. Um, the Pax Romana again, and here is the founding of the churches. These are some of the apostles in one of the very early, um, uh, uh, this is a mosaic of the apostles as Jesus is preaching to, to them. And the Roman Empire, of course, uh, Pax Romana, you could travel everywhere without any danger. Okay, here is an imaginary election of St. Peter as Pope, and so these uh, texts on Peter are taken as the foundation for the papacy, which would be later, of course. Okay, the early Christian practices. Um, the contemporary records are very, very accurate. We know exactly what happened in the early church because of the Acts of the Apostles and the letters they wrote to each other. 
uh, the epistles of St. Paul are not all written by Paul. Some are written by other people than, than are attributed to Paul, but they give an accurate account of the earliest Christian church. And, and what happens in these letters, why do they write letters back and forth to each other? Because what instructions did Jesus give to the apostles about how to build his church? What, what, did, what did he tell the apostles to do to build, his, to build the church? And how did he tell them to build the church after he died? Before he died, after he died, whenever. What did he say to them? Do you know? Say that to your microphone. He didn't really give them any instructions. You're right. He didn't. He didn't tell them how to build the church. He never mentioned the church. What did he say to them? He said he gave them one set of instructions. Go out and preach the gospel to all the world. Now, does that tell you how to build a church? No. Does it tell you who's going to lead the church? Does it tell you who's going to be the teachers? Who's going to be the governors? Who's going to, what are the offices going to be? What are they, will there be any buildings? What will they be like? No. It doesn't tell you any details about the church. The apostles had no instruction whatsoever about how to build that church. So, when they start out, uh, they start out, as an assembly of equals and they called the churches or the church itself and the individual churches they called it the ecclesia where have we heard that word before ecclesia ecclesia you remember pressure mark okay that was the assembly of the in Athens that was the assembly of all the people Okay, everybody was at equals in the assembly, and this is what they call the early church. It has its Greek beginnings. So they're drawing on Greek democratic ideals for the, for the earliest assemblies in the church, the assemblies of all the people. They lived communally. They lived together, the body of all believers. They called each other brother and sisters. And they were all equals living together, calling themselves brothers and sisters in a community of love. Um, they sometimes assembled in house churches so that, so that you know, believers might have a room in their house or make their house available. But there were no special buildings for the church. The church was not a building. It was a community of believers at this early time. And they would have, when they met together as a community, they would have a ritual common communal meal, a love feast, taking the bread and wine as the body and blood of Christ. Okay? So what do you think the Romans thought about that? What do you think the Romans thought about that? You have some readings about that, where the Romans actually say what they think about it. What did the Romans think about these brothers and sisters who loved each other and having communal feasts? and eating the body and blood of Christ what did they didn't they start rumors that they were eating babies and doing yes. vile things with animals and each other not to mention animals but just all sorts of horrible things that were going on in these communal meals supposedly yes they accused them of cannibalism they accused them of incest they accused them of, of all kinds they, they accused them of taking babies and wrapping them in dough and baking them in the oven and eating them because, because you know, you had a baby. Christ was born as a baby. You have the story of the baby being God. And, and then you have eating the body and blood of Christ. Well, the Romans got it all wrong, you know, and they accused them of all these horrible things. And so this is one reason they were really reviled, because uh, all of these things were going on. So there are ac uh, accusations of real cannibalism and orgiastic rites, and this, that they were having love fests and incest and, and um, uh, uh, wild sex parties. In addition, they preached exclusive monotheism, but they didn't deny the existence of other gods. They said, our God is the only God, but those other people you call gods, they, do, they really do exist. What they are are demons. Okay. So what do you think the Romans thought about that? That was, did not go over well for them. Now, who are these people who are going around preaching uh, the gospel of Jesus? Who are the people going around um, Spreading the word, spreading the gospel to everyone. Who are they? Who are Jesus' followers? 
I don't think your readings actually make this really clear to you, but think about it a minute. The followers are fishermen, they're tent makers, they're workers, they're craftsmen, they're washerwomen, um, maybe they're young people, and or maybe they're your nanny who's teaching your children that you're, you're going to go to hell because you're not a Christian and who's trying to tell your children that they should become Christians because they know the truth. Now, what do you think if your nanny or your washerwoman is telling your children that and your children are coming home and saying, well, Daddy, you're going to hell because you don't believe in Christ. You're, my nanny said so. Because they're fanatic and they're preaching it to everyone. And so the Romans were very upset about this. Uh, again, the Christians are corrupting the youth. I mean, they're spreading the word to, um, uh, the working class Christians are spreading the word to aristocratic children. Okay, um, and so here we have the Roman reaction, scorn for exclusivity, corruption of youth, and the working class. All right. And this is happening all over the Roman Empire because, interestingly, Christianity spread really fast and lots of people got involved in it very quickly. Uh, here is Christ uh, as a teacher and he is often shown, you know, I showed you that crucifixion. We'll see it again in a moment. Um, let's see if we have it. No, we don't have it there. Yes, there's that crucifixion. Um, this is how Christ was most often shown in the Roman Empire. I can't show you because, you know, I have to do the copyright free pictures. But Christ was sometimes, there's one famous picture where he's shown as a Roman soldier. He's a soldier of Christ fighting for the goodness. He's a most often uh, seen as a teacher as he is here or a wise man. Sometimes he's shown as a good shepherd like the god Apollo. Sometimes he's shown as the sun god uh, shining across the sky. He's shown in pictures that mimic what the pagan gods were shown as. But the most common is to show him as a teacher and a philosopher as he's shown in this picture. Now look at this picture of the crucifix. What do you see? Look at that and what do you see? How is Christ depicted? Remember I told you that crucifixion is, is something done only to the lowest criminals. Yeah. Christ is, well, first of all, he's alive. Yes. He doesn't look like he's in pain. And, uh, you know, he looks holy. He's not suffering. He's not dying. He's alive. He's conquering over death. Okay. And he, and he looks holy. He's got a halo around his head. This happens very early that they have halos around their head. And so he's, he's not dying. And this is really important because the early Christians didn't want to show him as dead or dying because that would mean that he was human. And so they didn't emphasize his humanity at all in these early depictions. They, they emphasize his godliness, his spirituality, his wisdom, his teaching, his, his conquest over death. Okay, and so, in, in fact, there aren't very many crucifixes in the, in the um, ancient world. In the earliest Christianity, they, they seldom showed him like this. They much more often showed him like this as the teacher who is the wise teacher or philosopher. And that's the most common depiction of Christ. This is from a church in 395 A.D. And so this is a very, this is a very early depiction um, in Christianity. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the beliefs of Christianity were hammered out in the midst of fights against heretics. Okay. In, in heresies and rival cults. Okay, but let's think for a minute about what the word heresy means. What does the word orthodox mean? Orthodox means right thinking. Okay, and there were, in the beginning, there were lots and lots of different groups of Christians around because Jesus didn't say who should be the leader. Okay, so first there was a bunch of Christians centered around James, who is the brother of Jesus, and this was in Jerusalem, and they were all Jews. Okay, so that's one group of Christians, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a group of Christians around Peter ending up in Rome, and he, he, Peter never really uh, preached anything concrete. He was, he was a little more neutral. Uh, Christ didn't give any instructions for the church, as we said. And then there was Paul's group. And Paul was not one of the apostles, but he was a later convert, but he assumed leadership. And... 
Paul took very many of the sayings of Jesus and he elaborated on them and you have that in one of the letters of Paul that you're reading where he quotes what Jesus says in the Gospels but this is even before the Gospels are written that he is quoting what Jesus said and then he elaborates on it and he he takes the basic saying of Jesus and then he expands it to its logical conclusion and if you take like everything Paul said he's systematically going through the words of Jesus and expanding them to their logical conclusions Uh, one thing he said was in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile slave nor free male nor female to Jews I became a Jew Uh, uh, and to the unlawful I became as one unlawful although I am not unlawful I became all things to all men to save souls so he then rapidly he is the one who said Christianity is for the Gentiles for everyone in the world not just for the Jews and so he's the one who really who really expanded the idea of Christianity as for being of all mankind so he took the teachings of Jesus to their logical conclusions Uh, there's something in print right now called the Q gospel which is a collection of sayings a book of sayings that that some scholars think underlie the the gospels of Matthew Mark and Luke that they are the common sayings in all of those gospels that then constitute what Jesus actually said and so it, it is posited that there's some underlying text and they've tried to reconstruct it and they call that the Q gospel which is a book of sayings and it leaves out a lot of the stories of Jesus's life um, here is um, St. Prudentia with the, the apostles on the left okay and here is uh, the crucifix again Okay, Paul began the Romanization of Christianity. He was a Roman citizen, and he's the one that people rallied around. Okay. And this is one reason why he rejected the Jewish law, because the Jewish law was so confining. And Paul himself was a Roman citizen, regarded all citizens of the world as eligible to be Christians. And you can see him thinking about the concept of the Roman Empire applying to the whole world. And he's he's applying it to the religion as applying to the whole world. And he really began the Romanization of Christianity. But Christianity was far from unified, and Paul wasn't the only leader out there. There were lots of other rival sects. Manichaeism, and you have one of your readings, is a text on Manichaeism and Manichae. And, and Manichaeism is very like Zoroastrianism. It's, it's more, like the, um, more like the Persian religion of dualism, where the material world is evil and the spiritual world is good. And, and, and Manichaeism sees Christ as spiritual and not human, not human and not part of the material world. This is dualism and it's taken into the Christian context. And so what, are the quest- what is the question the Manichaeans are asking? What is the relationship between Christ's earthly body and his heavenly soul? Okay, their answer is, He's not human. He never has an earthly body because earthly bodies are evil. Material things are evil. He only lives as a heavenly soul. This is descended from Zoroastrianism. Okay, Christianity responds to that. The, the issue is raised and Christianity responds that Christ is both fully human and fully divine. This is the answer they come up with. Um, that this that um, uh, to refute Manichaeism, so they come up with a different answer. And here again is Christ as a teacher; he's seen as a human being, and this is extremely important to the to the future of Christianity. What does it mean? I mean, to be human, if if God takes well, this is a question we could spend days on. But what does it mean if God takes human form? It means that human form is good and it has goodness in it because God has taken that human form. So what's happening here, and we can't dwell on anyone too long, but but 
what the Christians are doing is hammering out the beliefs of Christianity as these questions arise because Christ did not give the answers. And so the, the followers have to come up with these answers. One group of Christians uh, are Gnostic Christians and, and Elaine Pagels has argued that this is a Christian woman's movement because the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were discovered and she discovered these texts that um, that, uh, for example, there's a Gospel of Mary, and, and she, she de um, derived from these texts the principles of how the church was run, and so I'm going to run through these in a minute. The questions that were raised is, what is to be the structure of leadership of the church? Who is going to lead it, and how are the meetings going to be held? Well, what the Gnostics did was they met in their meetings and they had elections right at the meeting. Every time they met, they elected their leaders on the spot. And then when the meeting was over, uh, the, the leaders stepped down. Women could be elected as a leader of, of the gathering just as men could. And women were equal to men in the Gnostic uh, structure of leadership. So the orthodox answer is there's a hierarchy. Okay. And what they fasten on is apostolic succession. And they say the apostles were the first leaders of the church. And we choose our leaders by the apostles laying hands on their successors. So, so there's a chain of command going down from those who originally followed Christ to all their successors. So the answer to the questions that's raised, what is to be the structure of the leadership, is a different answer among the um, Orthodox, we'll call them the Orthodox, they all thought they were Orthodox, and the Gnostics. Okay, and the Gnostics. Question, who can participate and how? The Gnostics believed that women were equal to men and women could be priests and bishops because as we read the literature in the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, women served as priests and bishops. The Orthodox position, and when I say Orthodox, I'm, in, I'm identifying the group that won the whole struggle of who's going to be the real Christians. It's the Orthodox group. Uh, the Orthodox, and you have a reading of Paul, his writing about how are women to behave in the church. Women are to keep silent and obey their husbands. And essentially that's what Paul says about women. And uh, Elaine Pagels believes that this is the orthodox reaction against women because of, because of the Gnostics, because the Gnostics allow women to be equal. Okay, uh, let's, let's look at the Gnostics some more. The question, what is the nature of God? The Gnostic answer is, God is a trinity of father, mother, and son. We have the action principle, the wisdom principle, principle and the joining of those two principles, and that is the trinity. And the Gnostics say the Old Testament Jehovah is a false image of God for the immature because the Jews are too immature to understand what God is really like. And so only true knowledge through study and philosophy can come to, to those who truly believe and those who truly believe see God as father, mother, and son. It has that kind of a trinity. And so that they, so that as you progress, to more and more knowledge, you see the true face of God. Okay, so the Jews, so they're calling Je Jehovah a false face. And, and so this, what this does, is to trash the Old Testament, right? The, if you see Jehovah as, as some kind of a false teacher to the Jews. Well, the Orthodox say, of course, they, they don't like women in the Gnostic Church, and so the Orthodox say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God in three persons is the Trinity. Both of these are, uh, uh, you know, which is more monotheistic? Uh, it, it, it's, if you say there's God in three persons and God is both male and female and offspring in the, uh, in the Gnostic version, that can still be monotheistic if it's God in three persons, three guises. Uh, God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. They're both trying to, you know, stick to the monotheistic concept of God, but they see him as composed differently. Okay, now, what is the relationship of Jesus to God and the Holy Spirit? Okay, you can see in the Trinity, in, in the Trinity, they are all equal, uh, uh, and... Well, they're still all equal in the Gnostic version too, but they're different. This is a question they're asking, uh, both of them. 
Okay, now here are some even more crucial questions. How and when does God reveal himself to humans? Okay, what does the... Um, what does the uh, Bible say about that? Okay. Yeah. It's through the Holy Spirit. Yes. It, it delivers the message. But, but again, uh, Jesus was called the Word also. Yes, but but when will Jesus appear to us on earth? When has he appeared and when will he appear in in Christian doctrine, in Orthodox doctrine? Uh, For judgment. He'll appear at the last judgment. And he appeared, he appeared, what, three times to the disciples after he died? But then he ascended into heaven and he's not going to appear to us on earth or contact us until he appears again at the last judgment. Okay, compare this to what that's what the that's what the Orthodox Christians say. Compare this to what the Gnostics say. The Gnostics say that the spiritually mature will have direct contact with God, that as you become more and more mature, as you study and you learn more and your spirituality comes more mature, you'll have direct contact with God and He will make res- revelations to you and then you can preach those revelations to other people. Okay. So seers and revelations can be preached to the people. What is the difference between those two views and, and, and what are the consequences? If you're a Gnostic, if you're a Gnostic Christian and everybody's going around, they're having visions of God and they're preaching to the people, what's going to happen to the religion? Yeah. There's not a very good way to control that because anyone can say that they've had revelations from God and it's hard to establish an actual doctrine in a church when you can have such an individualistic nature of relationship with God. Exactly. You lose control. The leaders lose control of the development of the church if everybody can go around having visions according to their maturity. And so this is why the church said, okay, Jesus will appear. He appeared three times after death. And then he went to heaven. He's not coming again until the last judgment. And so nobody's getting revelations from Jesus in the, in the Orthodox Church. This is why it succeeds, whereas the Gnostic falls apart. Because you can't have any doctrine. Exactly what you're saying. The doctrine changes day by day if people are having revelations. So this is very important about why Orthodoxy wins the struggle between all these competing groups. Because they... they set up a leadership and they set up beliefs that allow them to control the people in the doctrine. Okay. How do we know a revelation is true? The Gnostics are spiritually mature, receive revelations and have direct contact with God. So I said, oh, this is a problem with this concept. You already answered it. Here is a woman praying to God. This is how people prayed in the ancient world. This is called Orantes. Everybody prayed this way. The early Christians prayed this way, and the and the um, uh, Romans prayed this way. The Greeks prayed this way. This is Orantes. This is praying. Okay, we're going to see how Christians start to pray this way later on. That, it's important in the development of Christianity. This is how the early Christians prayed. This is a woman, by the way, uh, who's praying. Okay, here's the sarcophagus at the uh, Lateran Museum. Okay, what about? Um, Orthodoxy, no more revelations. Uh, another question is raised by the heresy of Pelagianism. And Pelagianism asks the questions, do human beings have free will? And what is free will? Well, Pelagius answered, yes, human beings do have free will. They have complete free will. They make all their decisions themselves and they have to stick by it. You know, right or wrong, uh, everybody has complete free will. Okay, the church, the Orthodox Church, struggled with this. St. Augustine of Hippo said, well, yes, of course we have free will. What happens if we don't have free will? If we don't have free will, then our sins don't count, do they? If we don't choose, if we have no free will, we can't choose to sin or choose to do good. We have no choice if we don't have free will. So Augustine of Hippo redefines what free will is. 
free, yes, we have free will, but we only have free will if God grants us the grace to choose the good. Think about that for a minute. Yes, we have free will, but only if God gives us grace. Okay. So he's kind of saying we don't have free will. And why is he saying that? It's because of original sin. Because you can't have original sin if everybody has free will. Okay. So what he's constructing is what you can have it both ways. Everybody has original sin. They are doomed to original sin because of Adam's sin. But because of Christ, you can receive grace if you're good. And God can give you grace and then you can choose the good. Okay. So free will is freedom to choose the good according to Augustine of Hippo. And you have a reading by Augustine of Hippo. He is the philosopher of the early church. He set the parameters. He's the first medieval person. He set the parameters for the whole Christian church from that time after all. After it. Arianism is another heresy that arose at just this time and Arian asked the question what is the relationship between God the Father and God the Son well the priest Arius it's named Arianism because there's a priest named Arius he says in the Trinity the Father is greater than the Son okay what does this do to to monotheism if the Father is greater than the Son what does that mean what does it mean? It's what? Well, to me, it makes it seem like if they became separate people, like since the Father is greater and the Son has less power, it, se- it makes it seem as if there's two different entities at play. It destroys monotheism because you've, you've automatically got two gods there. If the Father is greater than the Son, they're different. And so they can't be three equal persons as the Trinity. So Arianism is declared a heresy by the, by the Orthodox Church. So the Orthodox says Father, Son, and Father is equal to Son is equal to Holy Spirit. Do you have a comment? Well, we would have, I would always view it as portions. I mean, if he always was, always will be, and he is, uh, he, he gave more of himself just like any father would. He gets a greater sum of who he is, plus what the son brings in himself. But the, but but if for a monotheistic God, the Father has to be the Son, and and, and they have to be one person with like three different faces, but not three different essences. Okay, their essence can't be different, or they're not monotheistic. They can have different faces but they can't have a different essence so they have to be equal or they're not monotheistic you see and this is what the Christians were arguing out and that's why these heresies all arose Donatism arose and this is, the, this is when the persecutions the great persecutions were happening in the church and the question they ask is who should perform the sacraments and what qualifies a priest or bishop for sacraments and what was happening was under the Donatists uh, uh, there was persecution in the empire and the Donatists were, were um, uh, recanting and they were saying um, they were recanting their Christianity and so the question is if a priest then recants his Christianity what about all the official acts he's already done? What about all the marriages he's performed? What about all the baptisms? What about all the last rites he's given people to go into heaven? Are these, are these valid even if the bishop recants his faith and burns his Bible? Are these still valid? The Donatist said no. These acts are not valid. Therefore, all the marriages are null and void. All the baptisms are null and void. If you have the last rites from a priest who recants, you go to hell. And your father does. And your children do if they've died and they've had the last rites. Okay. What does this do to the church if you have that, if you have that belief? What does it do to the church? Think about it. You're, what do you think? <laughs> 
self-destructive. It destroys the church. It destroys the church. Yeah, nobody wants to be a Christian if the rights are not valid, uh, if the bishops are not powerful. And they're... So what the Orthodox says is, uh, the Orthodox says that, um, and here is one of the here is one of the martyrs being uh, dying, uh, a Christian martyr, Saint Felicitas and her children. She's a martyr. Well, what do we have for martyr? Okay, I didn't answer that question. Um, the problem with this view is that the church falls apart, and so the Orthodox view is God chooses bishops and priests, and if whatever acts they perform in their official office have validity with God in heaven, that they are valid acts of any priest. It's the office that does these acts and not the man. Okay. And again, again, you were saying the church is held together by these concepts. This is what keeps it from falling apart. These are the decisions they make. And so that's why that's why the Orthodox position wins out, because the decisions they make on these issues that arise with the heresies the questions that come up, the decisions they make are decisions that hold the church together and bind it together instead of destroying it. Okay, uh, the, the blood of the martyrs is the uh, foundation of the church. I mean, and here we have martyrdom that um, the Romans... Uh, martyrdom happened, the persecution of the Christians uh, was not constant during the whole rise of Christianity. In fact, it really only happened in the very last years of the Roman Empire. The great persecutions were under Decius and Diocletian in the 4th century. So the Christians were not persecuted for a long time. You have in your readings that letter from Pliny to Trajan where Pliny says, what shall I do about these Christians who won't sacrifice to the emperor? And Trajan says, well, leave them alone, you know, and don't persecute them. And, and so it's only, it's only toward the very end of the Roman period that the Christians are actually persecuted. And here they are being thrown to the line. They actually were killed. Here is Felicitas, St. Felicitas. She's a woman martyr and all her children. Um, I think the children were killed, too, in that story. And here is uh, Timothy. This is Timothy the martyr. So, what about the New Testament? When was that put together? Well, like the Christian, Christian um, organization, it grew over time. It didn't happen overnight. Christ didn't say to, the, to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, write my history, it's going to be the New Testament. He didn't say that. Uh, they were written um, in the hundred years after his death and certainly not in his lifetime. We do have the Q Gospels that are his sayings that may have been written, but if they were written in his lifetime, they were lost. We don't have them now. What we have are the rival Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but there were lots of other Gospels floating around too. There were Gospels of Peter and James and Mary Magdalene and others around. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not the only ones. Uh, there's a book right now you can buy. The title is The Lost Books of the Bible. Uh, these include the rejected books of the Bible of various kinds, not just Gospels, but other books like stories about Jesus' childhood uh, and stories of Revelation. And these are all, it's a, it's a book that's been reprinted. You can get it. The Nag Hammadi manuscripts are Gnostic, uh, Gnostic uh, Gospels that were found um, by in in, an, in a cave by Arabs uh, that uh, and they use them to light their fire with. They lost a lot of it, but they've all been translated now, and they've all been they've all been uh, transcribed and read and translated so that you can buy them. and And these are alternative gospels to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, the Bible was put together actually at the Council of Nicaea and this was held in the reign of Constantine in the 4th century and Constantine the emperor led the group of scholars who chose which gospels to keep and which gospels to reject Okay, the rejected gospels tended more to portray Jesus like a Roman god or in the case of the Gnostic Gospels like Mary Magdalene as a God who communicated with people on a very individual level. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are more conservative and more biographical uh, than, uh, and, and, than um, the ones that 
uh, portray Jesus more like a Roman god. So choices were made, and there are a lot of testaments around. Why did Christianity succeed? We can always ask that question. Why did Christianity succeed? Well, partly because of the environment that it grew up in. Uh, that it was it grew up in a time, as we said, when people were looking for answers in the Pax Romana. People were questioning, is this all there is to life? People were looking for a greater meaning to life. And other rival mystery cults were very popular. The cult of Isis with a savior god. Zoroastrianism with a savior god and a kind of life after death. Mithraism. Mithra was a savior god. The Romans were looking for a savior. And we talked about the golden ass that the age of prosperity, the age of plenty, the age of, of uh, uh, self-indulgence and freedom, uh, that uh, this was not satisfying. Is there more to life than hedonism and enjoyment and prosperity? And here we have the gladiators and the beasts celebrating them, and the Roman baths, okay. Plus, the anarchy of the third century. In the third century, the Roman government broke down. The last uh, good emperor was Marcus Aurelius at the end of the uh, second century, and the empire fell apart. He was a co-ruler with Lucius Verus. They were then succeeded by Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus, and he was crazy. He uh, murdered senators. He was assassinated, and what happened was the government fell apart. There was no machinery for choosing a new emperor and it's at this time that the army recognized that it had the right to choose the emperor or it could have the right and so we have armies marching on Rome and various competing armies fighting with each other. So we have a 50 year period when we have barracks emperors put in on the throne by the armies. In 50 years there were 50 emperors. The borders were also breaking down and Germans were spilling across. They weren't invading, they weren't invading armies, but they were filling a vacuum as the Roman armies marched away. And these armies, especially in France and Germany and Britain, by this time they were composed mostly of Germans who had been settling in the empire. There was a shortage, uh, I told you there was a population decline and a shortage of manpower. By this time, the armies in Europe mostly consisted of Germans anyway who had taken careers in the, in the army. Here's Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius, um, the la last of the good emperors. Commodus, a crazy man, that he's got the headdress of Her Hercules dressing as a lion. Um, and so he declared himself almost a god. Here are the, uh, this. I shouldn't call this barbarian invasions. They're more. They're not military invasions. They're migrations moving into south into the empire because they want the prosperity. Think about our Mexican border, for example, where we have mass immigration across the border. This is what happened in Rome. You have these very poor poverty-stricken Germans moving in to get the prosperity of the Roman Empire and that's exactly what was happening as the Germans moved into Rome. Okay, uh, Septimius Severus, one of the barracks emperors, Caracalla and Elagopolis, barracks emperors, uh, don't they look like hard-bitten soldiers? The great persecutions happened under Decius and Diocletian at the end of the third century. The breakdown of the empire was blamed on the Christians and Romans were required to sacrifice to the emperors. Christians who refused were killed in various ways and it said that the blood of the martyrs were the seeds of the church. Decius was the emperor who first started the persecutions and here's a certificate of sacrifice and martyrs uh, again being persecuted. Roman hedonism, we had the breakdown of the family, divorce, contraception, abortion, exposure of infants, um, massive hedonism and, and um, sexual liberty, sexual license in the empire, economic breakdown, galloping inflation, the decline of cities and trade, population decline. Parts of the empire were actually breaking away. Gaul broke away, Spain and Palmyra in the east. But the empire didn't fall. Diocletian pulled it together. 
with the edict of maximum prices, he froze the prices, he reformed the army, and he divided the empire into new smaller divisions called dioceses. He made all jobs hereditary, and he said the rulers will be not one ruler, but four rulers, two Augusti and two Caesari, and who will share the rule, and the two Augusti will be senior rulers, and they will retire peacefully, succeeded by two Caesari, and then new Caesari will be elected. Well, did this work? Here's Diocletian. No, it didn't work. Here's the empire under Diocletian. It's divided into four parts and four different emperors are ruling it, two, two Augusti and two Caesari, and so it's divided into four parts. When uh, they retired, a civil war broke out, and the winner, in a, to put it in a nutshell, is Constantine, who actually takes over the whole empire at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. The symbol Cairo, which was a symbol, a Christian symbol, uh, was put on his um, standards, and he was told by priests that this would mean that he would win the battle and win the empire. He then reformed the coinage, and he then he issued the Edict of Toleration. He did not make Christianity the official religion of Rome, but he tolerated the Christians and he made them legal. Okay, so for the first time, the church can be a corporation, and it was tax-free and received support from the government. Eusebius of Caesarea wrote the oration to Constantine and the history, lauding Constantine as Constantine is to Christ as Christ is to God. Now think about that for a minute. That's heresy. It makes Constantine God, doesn't it? This is Caesaropapism and its syncretism or joining, uh, joining a lot of traditions together. The upshot is the church succeeded because of Constantine because Christianity made it legal, he gave it money, he took money away from the Roman religions and all the other religions, and he gave it to the Christian church. He made bishops officials in the Roman state. And so we have to say, ultimately, the success of Christianity, there's the Cairo, is due to Constantine. And here is the Arch of Constantine, Constantine triumphing. Okay, next week we're going to look at Byzantium and a parallel empire among the Chinese.